evening last night into the morning today, but <laughs> has it jeopardized getting a deal done when it comes to the Dreamers and immigration, which ultimately is a very big point for Washington and America? I'm Bill Hammer. Welcome to Friday, uh, live inside America's mm -hmm. Newsroom. How are you doing? That's a big question yeah. this morning. Happy Friday to mm -hmm. you, Bill. I'm Sandra Smith. The president says he was certainly talking tough during that private meeting on a new deal that had been floated on immigration, but this morning, He's pushing back, denying that he used a specific and contentious word, tweeting this. The language used by me at the DACA meeting was tough, but this was not the language used. What was really tough was the outlandish proposal made a big setback for DACA. Kevin Cork is live at the White House for us this morning. Kevin, how concerned is the White House that the president's comments could hamper or even upend this deal on DACA? Well, the deal is not yet a deal, right? And so the, from the White House's perspective, listen, they are convinced this is a fight worth having. Uh, the president's comments notwithstanding, uh, there has to be a deal on DACA at some point, they believe, and that means there also has to be a component for border security funding for a wall, or there simply will not be a deal in this particular case. Now, I do want to share, as you pointed out, uh, all this back and forth has been overshadowed by apparently the president's comments in that meeting yesterday, a source telling Fox News it was heated, fair amount of salty language, and in that meeting, the president is said to have said, why are we having all these people from blank countries come here. Well, the president is tweeting about that this morning. Uh, you shared one tweet. This is the latest one I can share. He said this, never said anything derogatory about Haitians other than Haiti is obviously a very poor and troubled country. Never said take them out. Made up by Dems. I have a wonderful relationship with Haitians. Probably should record future meetings. Unfortunately, no trust. The comment, as you also said, creating that firestorm of controversy both on air and online. The president within the last hour, again, pushing back uh, at the way that his comments have been characterized. Now, as for the deal on DACA itself, the president tweeted this, Sandra, uh, because of the Democrats not being interested in life and safety, DACA has now taken a big step backwards. The Dems will threaten shutdown, but what they are really doing is shutting down our military at a time we needed most. Get smart. Make America great again. And there's this. Messrs. Cotton, Grassley, and Purdue in a statement saying there's been no deal reached yet on DACA, on the future of DACA in the Senate. Uh, some of our colleagues have floated a potential plan that is, simply put, isn't serious. It's that kind of day already. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning, and this is what we're working with here in Washington, Sandra. I suspect it'll be that day throughout the day. Go ahead. What a week it's been, Kevin. Yeah. Also this morning, the president told the Wall Street Journal he believes text messages sent between FBI agents yeah. may have been treasonous. What can you tell us about that? Okay, so uh, to walk back the history of this, uh, Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, uh, both FBI agents, uh, Page apparently Strzok's mistress, uh, back and forth talking about having this insurance policy. The president interpreting that to mean that they were looking to have an insurance policy to keep then candidate Trump from winning the White House. The president telling the Wall Street Journal about that in his interview. I mean, this is the FBI we're talking about. I think that is that is treason. See, that's treason, right? there. He goes on to add, by the way, that's a treasonous act. What he tweeted, and I think he meant texted, to his lover is a treasonous act. Meanwhile, the president continues to insist the Russia collusion story is a hoax. Now taking aim at Dianne Feinstein, he tweeted this, Democrat Dianne Feinstein should never have released secret committee testimony to the public without authorization. Very disrespectful to committee members and possibly illegal. She blamed her poor decision on the fact that she had a cold a first. For her part, Feinstein uh, actually did apologize to Chuck Grassley for doing that, but that doesn't explain why she did it. And what's more, the damage may have already been done. We'll keep watching that story as well. Sam, turn back to you. Kevin Cork, live at the White House for us. Thank you. A bit more on all this now. Former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee, Fox News contributed live in Nashville, Tennessee. Sir, and good day to you. And Happy New Year. Thanks for being here. We, we can still so say that, by the way, up until the 15th of January. Listen, you're a man of words. Um, I, I just think the president needs to understand that everyone's listening all the time. And, and there are not, not everybody in that room wants him to win or succeed. And he, he's got to watch it. And, and be more careful. I don't know what was said or what was not said inside that room yesterday, but everyone's listening, Governor. Well, first of all, he should just say he had a cold, and so he didn't mean it, and uh, take the Dianne Feinstein uh, version. But look, if he said that, 
then Melania should have fed him a bar of ivory soap for breakfast this morning. But if he didn't say it, then there were other people in that room can verify that he didn't say it, and they need to come forth. But this president has to understand that every time he has a meeting, even with some Republicans, they're not necessarily going to be his friend, and people love to go and tell what they heard. That's why confidentiality is the key ingredient to someone that he puts in, as Robert De Niro would call in that movie, his circle of trust. And, and there are very few people who can be in that. Therefore, he's got to be careful what he says because it's distracting from getting this deal done. But in getting it done, Bill, he's got to play the tough line. He has the White House. He's got both houses of Congress. The Democrats say they want to dock a deal. Okay. They get it, but they have to give something. This can't be the wimpy version in the Popeye cartoon where I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Well, That's what the Democrats <laughs> seem to be wanting. Well, they can't have that. Yeah, you know, you wonder too. Yeah, great line, by the way, <laughs> going back to Popeye days. <laughs> Speaking of language, Nancy Pelosi let one rip yesterday when she said this about immigration and who's negotiating and who's not. Watch. The five white guys that called them, you know. Um, <laughs> I said, they you going to open a hamburger stand next or what? Um, the, um... <laughs> I don't know, but I, I think the five white guys want to get a deal, too. Do, do you think, based on that comment there, or others, do, do you think Democrats want to give this president a victory when it comes to immigration? No or infrastructure, no. <laughs> or pick your topic. No, you know, the sad thing is they care less about helping the DACA kids. They care less about helping American workers who could really benefit from the jobs provided by infrastructure than they do about shutting Donald Trump down. And that's unfortunate. Now, here's the problem. The Republicans are doing a pathetic job. And I'm not going to use the kind of language that would get me in trouble, but they're doing a pathetic job of communicating the fact that the Democrats are not working for the best interest of the American people, whether it's immigrants or whether it's workers, they're acting in the best interest of the Democrats, and that ought to be offensive. And for Nancy Pelosi to come out and talk about these white guys, I don't know, last time I checked, what color is Nancy? Did I miss something? Fancy Nancy who's out there criticizing who's trying to get the deal done rather than the deal itself. You know, she, I know she wants to sprinkle some caviar on her uh, Five Guys burger because she lives in a world that is so distant from the people who are getting the crumbs. But my gosh, Bill, uh, the Republicans have an opportunity to push this back, and I think they're failing miserably wow, in their communications. Yeah, this, you're, you're one of the best communicators out there. Uh, on the topic of Kim Jong-un, speaking of communicating, the Wall Street Journal did a sit-down with the commander-in-chief yesterday. 45 minutes. He touched on a lot of things. Peter Strzok, it's treason, what he did. And he talked about Kim Jong-un and said this, I probably have a very good relationship with Kim Jong-un. I have a relationship with people. I think you people are surprised, end quote. Is, is he giving something away? way in his comment about I don't what think, might be happening behind the scenes? I, I don't think so. I think he's just simply saying that uh, people like Kim Jong-un don't work well with people that they don't respect, and they don't respect people they don't fear, or people that they feel like will back down. Here's what Kim Jong-un now knows about Donald Trump. He doesn't back down. He's not a person who runs and hides in the corner when someone says something. In fact, he pushes back ten times harder than anyone pushes him. I think that means that Kim Jong-un would be far more likely to want to do business with Donald Trump than to test his resolve, because that would be fatal to Kim Jong-un should he try to do it. No, sir, thank you for your time. It's good to have you back here, okay? Words matter. Thank you, Bill. I know you know that very well, Governor. See you soon. From Nashville today, there's Thanks. Mike Huckabee. Thank you. Sandra. Well, we will have new reaction from the administration a little later in the hour. Mercedes Schlapp, White House Director of Strategic Communications, will join us live from the North Lawn. Keep it here for that. And may I say, yes, please. you have a way yes. with words. Yeah. Um, then does Governor Mike Huckabee. Yeah, with the bar of soap, was that? <laughs> the bar of soap. Was that the one? And if he did say it, claim he has a cold. No, we love you, Governor Huckabee. Yeah, 10 minutes past the hour right now. Meanwhile, another big story that we're watching for you this morning, we are awaiting a White House uh, announcement on Iran. President Trump deciding whether to keep waiving economic sanctions on Tehran. The penalties were rolled back as part of the nuclear agreement. The president has declined to recertify that deal. We will bring you that decision as soon as it happens. Yeah, watch that.
that story. More news on this busy day now. Uh, president Trump and the mayor of London resuming their war of words from across the Atlantic. Why the president's now canceling a trip to London. We'll tell you about that. And there's also this today. Have a listen. The Bill of Rights is something worth filibustering over and that the idea that we should have a judicial warrant before searching an American's records absolutely is worth filibustering for. Well, the House passing a renewal of the controversial FISA program. So will Senator Rand Paul follow through on his threat of a filibuster? We will ask him when he joins us live in just a few Looking moments. Looking forward to that. Also going from bad to worse in California. Mandatory evacuations expanded now with a threat of new mudslides. They do not need that. The latest on this disaster still unfolding in the search for survivors there in Santa Barbara. We're fine. We have... We have power and we got internet going and we with our hot spot on our phone and we thought we have water, then the power went out. President Trump says he's canceling a trip to London and taking a swipe at former President Obama in the process. U.S. staffers are expected to move into the new facility next week. The president explaining on Twitter, quote, reason I canceled my trip to London is that I am not a big fan of the Obama administration having sold perhaps the best located and finest embassy in London for peanuts, only to build a new one in an off location for $1.2 billion. Bad deal. Wanted me to cut ribbon? No. London Sadiq Khan weighing in saying, quote, his visit next month would without doubt have been met by mass peaceful prote protests. This just reinforces what a mistake it was for Theresa May to rush and extend an invitation of a state visit in the first place. Oh, how's that going, huh? Oh, wow. 15 past. The Senate now expected to take up the foreign surveillance program known as FISA next week. Yesterday at this time, a big deal in the House. The House passed it despite some lawmakers with these concerns over Americans being spied on. My next guest says he's ready to fight this bill in the Senate, tweeting, quote, no American should have the right to privacy taken away, hashtag filibuster. And that person is Kentucky Senator Rand Paul back home in Bowling Green. And Senator, a good Friday morning to you. And thanks for coming back. Thank here. you, Bill. Thanks what, for having me. What is your next move, Senator? Well, you know, if there was ever something worth filibustering, I think it would be filibustering for the Bill of Rights. What we have is a program called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and you're supposed to be, or the grant of power, is to spy on foreigners in foreign lands. I'm all for that. We need to protect our country. But we don't use the Constitution for these foreigners. We just grab up all their information. In fact, a couple of years ago, there was a report that we recorded all of the phone calls in Italy in one month. So we have this enormous capacity to record phone calls. It's not just who you call, but it's also the content of the phone call. In the process of this, millions of Americans are recorded in there. So if the president calls a European leader or the Russian leader, or the Chinese leader, the president's phone call is recorded in this, believe it or not. If I call a foreign leader, if you call a journalist in the Fox Bureau in Europe or the Middle East, your phone call can be in this database. So there are a lot of innocent people who are in here, and it should not be searched for American data without a warrant. All we're asking is go to a judge and uh, have some evidence evidence to get started. Warrants aren't that difficult to get, but warrants are a check and a balance. And if you look back at every president from FDR forward, you know what? Every one of them have been accused of spying on their opponents. I mean, LBJ apparently put a bug on Goldwater's campaign plane. Nixon was uh, accused of using the intelligence agencies. Now we fast forward to today, and we have FBI agent Strzok and his girlfriend plotting at FBI headquarters to try to stop Donald Trump from being president. So I think we need more oversight of these people, not less. Okay, now I'm a bit confused because I listen to your argument, and then I hear Paul Ryan on the floor of the House at this hour yesterday when he said the following. Roll this. This is about foreign terrorists on foreign soil. That's what this is about. You pass the Amash Amendment and defeat this, this, this underlying bill, we go back to those days where we are flying blind on protecting our country from terrorism. So is he right or are you right? What is it? Uh, it's frankly, uh, the, the best way I can describe what he said is disingenuous. We don't stop any of the collection of the data. We reauthorize a program in the Amash Amendment, the Paul Wyden Amendment. We reauthorize a program. We never interrupt the collection of foreign data on foreigners. 
What we do is say that if Americans are accidentally caught up in it, this is about Americans. This isn't about foreigners. This is about Americans. If Americans are accidentally caught up in this, if you want to look at their stuff, you have to have a warrant. And here's the problem with Paul Ryan and his ilk and all of these people. Their reform bill actually makes it worse. In their reform bill, they say that America, information collected on Americans can be used for anything tax evasion, your, your grandson smoking pot somewhere, any of these minor things that happen in our country that usually you're protected by the Constitution, well, they've gathered this information well, with no constitutional I, I protection. S- it's awful yeah. what they want to do. Do you filibuster next week? Because I, I don't think in the end you can ultimately stop it, can you? The only way a filibuster succeeds is you have to get to 41 votes. So part of the reason you speak for a while, as sometimes for a long while, but the part of the reason you make arguments is because it's an important issue. But if you can convince 41 colleagues, if 41 people will vote with me, they can't pass it. And the other side will squawk and go crazy and say the world will end if we don't pass this. What would happen if we don't pass this is we would go back to the negotiating table and we would say we want more protections for American privacy okay, so, so and today, they would have to though, compromise. Should we expect a filibuster from you next week on the floor of the Senate, yes or no? There will be a filibuster, yes. Oh, we shall watch for that. Quickly, yesterday you said there will be an immigration deal. You were very optimistic. Do you still feel the same given the comments that apparently were said at the White House during that bipartisan meeting yesterday? Yeah, I still think that it's something that uh, the Democrats are driven to want to fix for DACA. Many Republicans are willing to meet them halfway and have a compromise. And I think the Democrats acknowledge they're not going to get a fix for DACA unless they do something for border security. It's going to have to be significant border security improvements. It's going to have to involve barriers and walls. It's going to have to involve getting rid of the diversity lottery and going to a merit-based immigration where we get the best and the brightest that want to come to our country. So your, your opinion and it's has to involve not, getting rid of chain migration. Your opinion has not changed since yesterday then, correct? I think we still get there, yeah, if the Democrats are willing to compromise and negotiate. Thank you, Senator. Have a good weekend. That's Rand Paul back home in Bowling Green, Kentucky. We'll see you very soon. Thank you. Attorney General Jeff Sessions is officially investigating the Obama administration after a bombshell new report reveals what they may have done to get the Iran nuke deal through. We will speak to an investigative reporter who broke the story. Plus... There's just so much shaming that's happening because if you ever open up that you have certain viewpoints, then you'll be, uh, your career will be sabotaged. So a former Google engineer suing the tech giant claiming Google discriminates against conservatives. That former employee, James Damore, is our guest here today on America's Newsroom. Don't go anywhere. Attorney General Jeff Sessions now creating an investigation team that will focus on drug trafficking by the Iran-backed militant group Hezbollah. The move comes after a bombshell report claiming that a similar investigation into Hezbollah was soft-pedaled during the Obama administration in order to get that Iran nuclear deal through. That original report coming from Politico, titled The Secret Backstory of How Obama Let Hezbollah Off the Hook. Joining us now, Josh Myers. He is the investigative reporter who politi- for Politico who broke this story. And we thank you for coming on this morning. Uh, your report reveals a lot of things. First, I want, I want to get your thoughts at, after you found out that Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, would then be officially investigating the Obama administration as a result of this 26-page report that you wrote. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, thanks, Sandra. I, I mean, I think this is good news. I mean, uh, the attorney general a couple of weeks ago, right after the story was posted, uh, said that he wanted to launch an investigation into what the Obama administration did, uh, how these investigations, uh, prosecutions, extraditions, and so forth uh, were soft peddled. Uh, and by the way, the story didn't say that they did it specifically um, to protect the Iran deal. What happened was that because they were so determined to get the Iran deal, there were a lot of things that happened uh, that, that had this as the sort of perhaps unintended, maybe intended consequence. So it's a little more complicated. But the news yesterday, I think, is, is being greeted uh, much more positively by the frontline agents, uh, you know, because they would rather 
as much as they want to get answers as to what happened to Project Cassandra, which was derailed, uh, this multi-agency task force, they want to move forward and, and look at uh, whatever they can do to resurrect these cases, uh, go after dozens of super facilitators that they've identified, uh, and, and help basically take the fight to the enemy. The attorney general in his statement when he announced this investigation into the Obama administration said this, quote, the Justice Department will leave no stone unturned in order to eliminate threats to our citizens from terrorist organizations and to stem the tide of the devastating drug crisis. What did you learn that they, what they may have done, uh, the Obama administration, in order to push this Iran deal through? What did your report reveal? Um, well, Sandra, I mean, it, this is all very complicated stuff. Uh, the story, as you noted, is 13,000 words, so there's a lot of nuance to it that I think sometimes gets lost in the headlines. But what happened was that you had a multi-agency task force, Project Cassandra, based at the DEA, and, and then there were many instances when they were trying to go after some of these guys, including um, Hezbollah's uh, chief envoy to Tehran, the state sponsor, Abdullah Safiuddin, that, that, that these guys, that there was sort of a force field of protection around these guys. Sometimes when they were actually arrested overseas, they couldn't get them extradited. Uh, uh, sometimes investigations or prosecutions were, were delayed, derailed, undermined, and so forth. So they want to, they, they do believe that there are dozens of, of cases uh, that, that didn't go forward. A couple of them actually did go forward only after the Trump administration took office. So again, you know, what they want to do is, uh, is, is basically dust off the case files uh, and, and try to, you know, go after these guys. The problem is that you've lost a lot of uh, precious time. A lot of the brain trust, the people behind Project Cassandra were transferred to other positions or left government entirely. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the people that were witnesses and even the suspects, have, uh, the trail's gone cold. So the question is going to be how much of this stuff can you, um, can you get back uh, into play? You know, as you've been detailing just how long this piece is, 26 pages, in the very first page you make one of your strongest points and really the point that we need to get to here, and that mm -hmm. is, quote, you write, but as Project Cassandra reached higher into the hierarchy of the conspiracy, Obama administration officials through an increasingly insurmountable series of roadblocks in its way. Mm -hmm. Those roadblocks you have, begin to, you have begun to describe to us, uh, you mm -hmm. say are according to dozens of of interviews, most um, that were given in, in complete secrecy, uh, government documents, you went through records. How did you go about your reporting on this? What were those roadblocks? Well, I mean, the reporting of this wasn't wasn't easy, and I, um, I really uh, commend uh, and thank Politico for letting me have the time uh, to pursue this. It did take months, months of time, uh, dozens, many dozens of interviews and so forth. Uh, and you'll note that a lot of the people are on the record uh, with this, which is somewhat unusual. That wasn't easy to do. But, you know, the roadblocks, I think, were, were many. Um, and I had done an earlier story in April about counterproliferation investigations that did suffer a similar fate uh, under the Obama administration. So you had individual cases that were not, um, that did not move forward, and the frontline agents and even prosecutors uh, believe that they were, you know, in some cases sandbagged. Uh, one case in particular against this top envoy, they sent a prosecution memo down to Maine Justice for approval, and, and Preet Bharara, who is the U.S. attorney in New York, and his special team of international terrorism and uh, narcotics prosecutors wanted a prosecution, and it was uh, turned down by the Justice mm. Department. But you also had, you know, whether the, they, they weren't pressing for extradition, they never leaned on the government of Lebanon. Uh, to, to uh, agree to uh, extradition of some of these people. Mm -hmm. A lot of these guys are moving around Lebanon uh, pretty openly these days. Well, you are, you are getting praise from some. Senator Ben Sass is praising the decision by Jeff Sessions, saying this is national security 101. We've got to hunt down these terrorists <clears throat> who, who fund mm -hmm. global violence with domestic drug money. I know you're getting a lot of response, including from the Obama administration, on all yeah. of this. Um, we'll yeah. see what they find. Uh, yeah. Josh, thanks for coming on this morning. My pleasure. 9.30 now here in New York. President Trump now floating the possibility of recording these White House meetings, denying making derogatory comments about during those immigration talks, I should say. But we'll tell you about that in a moment. How will that impact negotiations to get an immigration deal done? Does it affect it at all? The White House rejecting a plan with some bipartisan support. There has not been a uh, deal reached yet. However, uh, we still think we can get there. And uh, we're very focused on trying to make sure that that happens. The president's been clear about what his priorities are. 
President Trump slamming a bipartisan immigration deal proposed by lawmakers at the White House yesterday. The president also denying that he made a vulgar comment during the meeting to describe immigration from Haiti and other countries. The president tweeting this morning, never said anything derogatory about Haitians other than Haiti is obviously a very poor and troubled country. Never said take them out. Made up by Dems, I have a wonderful relationship with Haitians. Probably should record future meetings. Unfortunately, no trust. Let's bring in our panel. Juan Williams, a Fox News political analyst and author of We the People. And Matt Schlapp is former White House political director and chairman of the American Conservative Union. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. Matt Schlapp, I will give you the floor this morning to respond to I take your pick where do you want to begin the president slamming down this deal or that ch the choice of words well okay so first of all the president is saying that he didn't say these things and I think that's good because I think um, it does uh, we have to be careful uh, people are proud of where they come from but here are the facts the facts are I don't know anybody who spent two weeks on the beach in Haiti uh, it's a it's a country that has I incredible problems, both with its government structure and everything else. All these journalists that are out there attacking the president. What he's really trying to say is is this, which is we have, for instance, these El Salvadorans who he's saying, I'm going to stop renewing their temporary protective status and send them home. And what this deal was in the Oval Office was to bring that as a part of this immigration deal. And I think the president said, look, I told you what we, we can do. We can do DACA with wall funding, ending chain migration, and ending the diversity lottery system. Don't go around and start bringing in all these other issues, else you're going to blow the whole thing up. And he wanted to make that very clear. But I hope the president learned a lesson. When the Democrats and their staff are in the Oval Office, they're going to say and leak anything to harm you politically, but to, but and they to did be that. Clear, to be clear, Matt, Fox News has confirmed his choice of that of his choice of words uh, in that meeting. But, but Juan, to, uh, to the president's point in his tweet, maybe he should televise all of these uh, just in case people are getting his message wrong or his use of a particular word was met in a different way. Maybe he should put the key TV cameras back on like he, like he started the week doing. Remember that bicameral, bipartisan meeting? It seems so optimistic and positive and constructive. And it's just taken a wild turn of events this week. Well, I remember, Sandra, that started out as an effort, I think, by the White House team to demonstrate that the president was competent, that there should be no question about his fitness to perform his duties, questions that had been raised in that somewhat scurrilous Michael Wolf book. And now you have at the end of the week, we're thinking, gosh, again, you know, intemperate comments, he's going off the cuff. You know, my, my response to Matt is, you know, I don't think that anybody has any doubts about the troubles that beset places like Haiti. but. When you attach it to the people coming from it is when I think you then see even Republicans like Mia Love, whose parents came from Haiti, the congresswoman from Utah, say, you know, that's just un unacceptable language coming from the president of the United States. OK, so how about Nancy Pelosi's comments, though? Um, she, the, the House Minority no outrage. Leader, five white guys she referred to leading these talks on immigration reform. Um, it didn't go over too well, I should let everybody know, right, Matt? She said the five yeah, white guys, I, mean, I called them you know. Uh, this was her weekly press briefing. Um, it seemed to, to be a really uncomfortable moment for everybody in that room. And then she kind of tried to go through and, and, and reference the, the East Coast burger train, chain five guys by saying, are they going to open a hamburger stand next or what? <laughs> it just doesn't seem like she's talking talking about the issues here. And it was a real attack on Steny Hoyer, who is an Anglo, but uh, cares very much about coming up uh, with a deal that gives uh, a deal on DACA. So I think, look, we all know uh, we're coming up on Martin Luther King Day here. And when I was a kid, the big lesson after Jim Crow and the civil rights was the idea that we should be a colorblind society, that we judge people by the content of their character. If five white guys in Congress who agree with, a couple of them agree with Nancy Pelosi on the policy goals or negotiating it, it shouldn't matter the color of the skin, it shouldn't matter what their policy goals are. And I think in America, we are just sick and tired of this saturation of race. Let's talk about the policies. The president's trying to get to an immigration deal. Steny Hoyer's trying to get to an immigration deal. I don't care their genitalia. I don't care their racial origin. I care about the policy that they're pushing. You know, Steny Hoyer responded to those comments, Juan, uh, saying, quote, the comments offensive. I'm committed to ensuring that dreamers are protected, and I will welcome anyone to the table who wants to get this done. Right. So now let's give Nancy Pelosi the benefit of the doubt, which is that she is speaking about the idea that there was no one there who had any Hispanic background, any background 
a you know, relationship that, to the community. Does that mean? Does that mean that well, those men don't want to get something done? No, no, not at all. I think Matt's right. You can have people of any color, of goodwill, who are knowledgeable on the subject discussing it. But remember, even the four from the Congress plus, uh, you know, the chief of staff, Mr. Kelly, said, you know, let's get Robert Menendez in here, the, the senator from New Jersey, Hispanic background. Let's get somebody in here looking at the language, sensitive to the issue, familiar with it in, a, in detail because they know of the human well, toll uh, that comes from changes in immigration law. As far, far as where we are this morning, Matt, the president is tweeting this quote, because of the Democrats not being interested in life and safety, DACA has now taken a big step backwards, the president Good. writes. The Dems will threaten shutdown, Good. but what they are really doing is shutting down our military at a time we need it most. So to tie this all together, will the right. president's recent choice of words get in the way and give Democrats more leverage when it comes to funding the government by this dead deadline next Friday. Look, I hope so, Sandra, because I think uh, we ought to be awfully careful before we rush through a deal on immigration. We need to really think it through. I wouldn't mind if they took a lot of time this year. And I also think that the Democrats blew it. And Lindsey Graham, quite frankly, blew it. When he came in there with these extraneous issues on the El Salvadoran population that's being sent back and some of these other communities, they blew it. They're expanding what they want the Republicans to accept, and that's a mistake if they want to deal on DACA. All right, we're going to have to leave it there, gentlemen. Thanks to both of you for being here this morning. Good to see you. All right, nice 20 minutes Good before morning. the hour. More on this in a moment. Mercedes Schlapp, White House Director of Strategic Communications, our guest from the White House. Talk to Mercedes in a moment. And this car racing. Seeing a river of mud and sliding its way through it, an iconic image from the devastation in California. We are live on the scene, but first, here's the driver inside of that car you just saw. To feel the rocks from the boat just hitting against the car, I, I say, you know what? This car is done today, you know, or maybe we're done today. Walmart's planning to close dozens of Sam's Club stores, announcing that 63 locations will close, while planning to convert some into distribution centers in order to keep up with fulfilling online orders. On the same day, Walmart also announcing they are raising their hourly wages to $11 an hour and handing out bonuses of up to $1,000. We've heard that from a lot of companies, have we? More than eight. So here we go on that. Stay tuned. The Dow, by the way, is flying. It's up triple digits in this morning of trading so far. So watch that. 119, 121. I mean, what's she going to stop? All right, you just heard that Fox News alert now. President Trump denying that he used vulgar language in describing certain countries while talking about a potential immigration reform deal yesterday at the White House. So then, is a deal still possible? Apparently, the president was presented with an idea on behalf of the Democratic leadership that did not meet his, his minimum for qualifications and an immigration deal that he would accept, and, well, it went from there. Mercedes Schlapp, White House Director of Strategic Communications with the Now North Lawn. How are you doing, Mercedes, in your Great new role? Congratulations you, to you, and welcome Thank back you. here, and good morning. Moments good morning. ago, the president tweeted this. The language used by me at the DACA meeting was tough. But this was not the language used. What was really tough was the outlandish proposal made a big setback for DACA. Two things in there. First of all, in the language. Yeah, no Has question. Has it been reported inaccurately, Mercedes? Well, you know, I think there's definitely been selective leaks. There's been inaccurate reporting on this. I think, quite frankly, when you're looking at this, it's the fact that, you know, this issue on immigration, it's a tough issue that requires tough talk. And these uh, members of Congress came in, the Democrats came in uh, with a bad deal. And it didn't include the priorities of the president that we needed in terms of ending chain migration and ensuring that we eliminate the visa lottery uh, program. As we know, uh, the president this week had a brilliant, uh, brilliant move in bringing in the press in that 55-minute meeting, that transparent meeting with bipartisan members of Congress to talk about his immigration priorities and get moving on this security and, and we'll see deal. whether or not in the end they get that. Let me come back to that point. Are, are you saying he did not use what has been reported? Is that not true? Yes or I no? Was, I was not in that meeting, but what I can tell you is that he made it very clear that the, that language was not, the language was not used, and it's very clear that this is the Democrats trying to derail this process and where we're getting closer to the point that what they're focused on, the Democrats, is even talking, having these talks about shutting down the government, uh, which I think presents an incredible problem when you're dealing with the fact that we're trying to fund okay, the Okay, so j just to be clear, that the official 
statement from the White House is that language was not used. Well, do, do I was I not in the room. I was not in the room, and it was very clear that he, in his tweet, is his tweet stands, which was the language was not used. Orrin Hatch said this, I look forward to getting a more detailed explanation regarding the president's comments. Part of what makes America so special is that we welcome the best and brightest in the world, regardless of the, their country of origin. Um, I, I don't think you disagree with that. What, what would you say to Senator Hatch just to clear this up or clarify well, it or, or, I mean, or get very, beyond it? It's very clear that... Uh, we want, all, you know, immigrants to come to this country regardless of, regardless of uh, their background in terms of making sure that we focus in on what their skills are and what they can contribute um, to the economy. And this is why, like in other countries, that we want to see merit-based system. I mean, that's very clear that what we, the system we have right now is that one in 15 immigrants that are coming into this country uh, are the ones that are coming, ba that have skills. We need to change that. We need to allow for a system where we're able to match the skills of the immigrants coming in uh, to then match what we need in terms of contributing to the economy, as well as ensuring that we don't depress wages, and also ensuring that we're helping uh, the American workers, which is where the president is focused. Okay, I don't have much time, but I have two other topics here that are very important today. Wall Street Journal quoted this from yesterday. I probably have a very good relationship with Kim Jong-un. I have relationship with people. I think you people are surprised. Wow. Has anything changed? With Pyongyang after well, that clear, comment? Cl well, clearly, I mean, we continue with a maximum pressure campaign on uh, the North Korean dictator. I mean, it's very clear. We just saw uh, that China has sharply dropped its trade with uh, North Korea, and we're making progress in ensuring that uh, North Korea changes its behavior. Uh, we know that the goal here is to denuclearize North Korea. And I think that there is one of the things the U.S. has been able to successful, successfully do, as well as the, President Trump, is ensuring that other countries, and we want other countries to do more in uh, working on uh, putting financial okay. and diplomatic pressure on North Korea. Just to be clear about this, has the president spoken with Kim Jong-un, the North Korean leader? Uh, we, we don't have a, a, a comment on that right now in terms of whether he has spoken to Is it possible that, that it's happened? Uh, uh, it has. Uh, we do not have a comment on on that right now. Okay. Um, last topic. It has to do with our oldest ally. Here's what came of this. Reason I canceled my trip to London is that I'm not a big fan of the Obama administration having sold perhaps the best located and finest embassy in London for peanuts, only to build a new one in an off location for $1.2 billion. Bad deal. Wanted me to cut ribbon. No exclamation point. I understand that decision was made by President Bush 43, but um, I, I think the bigger point is this. Quickly tell us what is the state of our relationship with England, our oldest ally. Is well, it in clear, good shape or not? Well, England continues to be obviously one of our oldest allies in, in working with them, and especially on fighting uh, the, uh, terrorism and, and taking down ISIS. Uh, we, you know, we have a close relationship with this on, on, in England. But the, obviously, the issue here is the fact that the president uh, believed that this building was very expensive. He is uh, not going to be a, attending a, a ribbon cutting ceremony. He's here focused working in, in the United States for the American are people. Are we in good and standing? Getting results. Just quickly, are we in good standing with London or not? Yes or no? And I got to yes, run. Yes, we're in good good standing okay. with England. Mercedes Schlapp, thank you for your time. We are out thank of time you. for now. Thanks. Back after this. Evacuation orders are expanding in California to essentially all of Montecito. 43 people remain missing. After those deadly mudslides ravaged Santa Barbara County, 17 people have been killed. This video might be the most shocking video of all from these mudslides. You've probably seen it before. Here it is. Mud and water nearly engulfing this speeding car. And now we're hearing from the driver. I wasn't aware of what kind of danger was coming down the hill, you know because the water got worse as, as the minutes went by. You could feel the car lift up when the, when the wall of water from behind hit the car. Wow, Adam Housley, live in Montecito, California, with the latest there. Hey, Adam. Yes, Senator. In fact, that video came from about maybe 60 or 70 miles where we are, from where we are in Burbank, California. There was actually more water that came down here in Montecito between five and six inches that caused the destruction behind me. Uh, some A little bit of good news amidst all the bad news here. The missing number we've just been told has dropped from 43 down to between five and seven. Uh, so that's uh, still going to fluctuate. We're told, unfortunately, 17 people uh, were killed uh, from these mudslides, including four children as young as, an, as the age of three. 
three, you can see the destruction here. We've seen a lot of time in these neighborhoods over the years in Montecito, a community of about 10,000 people. Uh, to see this destruction is truly unbelievable. And the home here, as you can see, is one of 65, we've been told, uh, were destroyed. The sheriff says even with all this mud and all the time has passed, there's still a little bit of hope some people might be found alive. Take a listen. In disaster circumstances, there have been, you know, many miraculous uh, stories of people lasting many days, and uh, we, you know, we certainly are searching for a miracle right now. And that miracle uh, tends to go away with every passing minute. It's very cold here overnight. Uh, the mud obviously has been here now for a number of days. 462 homes were damaged, 65 destroyed. Again, the little glimmer of good news amidst all the bad news here is the fact that they're now missing only five to seven people, Sandra. And as I give it back to you, to give you an idea, we're several miles from where the fire burned. The fact that the